ask the audience to trust me. This actually is a presentation about software engineering <laughs> and not just a, a way for me to get to play music in front of a bunch of people. And I also have to have a disclaimer here. How many people here consider themselves to be musicians? To all of you, my sincerest apologies. <laughs> uh, this particular presentation uh, was originally for Pi Tennessee. Uh, and I submitted three proposals for Pi Tennessee, two very serious, very technical ones. And then I decided that I would give something to entertain the selection committee. And I made a proposal that was entirely a joke. <laughs> Guess what happened? <laughs> You called my bluff. And so I had to learn to play an instrument. <laughs> now, granted, I played uh, uh, oboe in grade school and high school, but that was a long, long time ago. So I had to learn an instrument, and I had to actually find a connection between Baroque music and software engineering. I didn't expect that this presentation would be so successful. This is the seventh time I've given this presentation. I've been invited all over the country. I've given it to the Department of Energy, several times in Silicon Valley, uh, all over the place. So consequently, uh, I've gotten a lot better at playing music. <laughs> uh, we're still waiting for Carl's breakfast. Oh, you've got your breakfast. We're ready to go. Okay. All right. So. This presentation has a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of different things that I have to be doing on my computer and my keyboard and my instrument and speak at the same time. There are many things that can go wrong. I expect some things will go wrong. And at some points, I'm going to be reading a piece of music and I'm going to entirely blank and like, I don't know how to play this. <laughs> but anyway, here we go. We're going to start this presentation there. Off. I hope.
Thank you. Um, when I'm playing music, try and mute my mic. I think there was a little bit of feedback in there that I heard. Okay. So, hi. Vivaldi Concerto, uh, written for oboe nearly 400 years ago. Control minus, that looks better. Nearly 400 years ago. Um, and you know something? I call it Concerto in G, because he wrote it in G. But I didn't play it in G. All my fingerings I played were in F. And to be honest, the music that you heard was in C. Yet it all worked. And in fact, when he originally wrote that piece of music, he did not write it for an electric bassoon. Indian sitar, Turkish zithers, and Jamaican steel drums. And I'm willing to bet, bet that the thought never even crossed his mind that someone in the future would be using instruments like this. Yet it all worked. I stood up here and played that piece of music. I didn't have a seizure and fall over. None of you in the audience burst into flames. It all just worked. So what is it? Or, Nothing, nothing, nothing completely fell apart. What is it about 400-year-old music that allows it to still work? Yet we as software engineers will write software that may last months, maybe a few years, maybe a little longer. Is there something we can learn about what they did in music to make it last so long that we can apply in software engineering? So, hello, there's no introduction from anyone else. I'm introducing myself. My name is Lars. I work for the Mozilla Corporation. I'm one of the uh, people that brings you Firefox. Uh, I am the Mozilla Web Engineering Herd Patriarch. <laughs> so, and in case you hadn't figured it out by now, I'm somewhat of an eccentric. Uh, not only can I be often occasionally seen in public wearing antlers, but I am over 50 years old and I still work as a programmer in Silicon Valley. In fact, that, that might actually qualify me for endangered species status. I haven't applied yet. So this uh, career of mine has led me to become a skeptic. I've been doing this for a long time. And I find that software engineering is as beholden to the whims of fashion as the apparel industry is. There are things that are cyclical in what we do. Some of the new programming techniques that we use today, I recall experimenting with back in the 1980s. And we moved away from them. And now we're moving back to them. And unfortunately, that has also made me somewhat of a heretic. Those of you that know me know to never mention PEP-8 in my presence. 
I used to work many, many years ago for a company in East Glacier, Montana, run by a man who was an IBM refugee. And he had this, present, this paper that talked about coding style standards and how bad they were for code reviews. Because if you have a coding style standard, it's low-hanging fruit to say, oh, this doesn't meet the standard. And so the person doesn't actually have to read the code. If the code is in a form that they don't understand or not familiar with, they have to read it and they have to understand it in order to give you a, a good review. And that's just my opinion. So anyway, uh, my career, I say in my, my profile that I've been at this for 35 years, if you count that piece of software that I sold to my father's law firm when I was 15 years old, uh, I have actually had a 40-year career as a professional engineer, engineer. And I had the honor last summer of going around and visiting some of the companies that I worked for 10, 20, and 30 years ago to find out what became of my software. Did it, was it still in use? Did anyone even remember that it existed? As it turns out, there's some Fortran code that I wrote in 1985 that is still use in use today driving flatbed plotters and writing, routing school buses for almost every single child in America. The company that works, that does that is still in business, still uses my software, and practically owns the entire market for this. What was it about that software that made it last so long? Well, I abstracted the concept of the flatbed plotter so that when a new flatbed plotter came out or a new form of, of plotting maps came out, they would just have to write one piece of code to, for that plotter and plug it in. It was an abstraction that made that last so long. Fast forward 10 years from that, 20 years ago, I'm working for a company called Rogue Wave Software in Corvallis, Oregon. I wrote for them a, a piece of software called DB Tools. It was an encapsulation of the SQL language and relational databases. In other words, it was SQL Alchemy for C++ 10 years before SQL Alchemy existed. It is, in still, use, it is still in use today. And uh, you can't trade stock, you can't get a phone bill, uh, and you can't get an airline reservation without that software it's somewhere down in the background working. Still in use today. Everything that I wrote in my career that hard-coded anything, external resources, is gone. It's forgotten. It, it might as well never have done it, I suppose. And I, I kind of want my, my software to live on. I don't want to just write temporary things in my life. So music is kind of the same way. It lasts a long time. Are there some abstractions in music that uh, we can learn from? That's what we're going to talk about next. So I have divided my presentation into movements. Uh, and this first one is going to be Vivace. Vivace is Italian, means quickly. This movement is going to go by very fast. In fact, so fast, this could be the last slide of my presentation. An API should be independent of its implementation. Think about that. Think about the code you've written in the last two weeks while I offer you a musical metaphor. Now, that metaphor didn't make any sense until I'm redundant. So, I'm going to repeat myself. An API should be independent of its implementation. Let me offer you a musical metaphor. Have I made my point? It'll get clearer and clearer. Let's go on to the next movement. Allegro non troppo. Allegro meaning quickly. Non troppo meaning but not too quickly. Now that's ambiguous. And there's a lot about music that is ambiguous. But in programming, we try to be as unambiguous as possible. Maybe if we loosen some things up, we might get some better abstractions and some longevity in software. But we need some common language first. I need to give you all a little bit of remedial music theory for programmers. Now, 
most of the music that you've heard in your life is based on a 12-tone chromatic scale. Now, not all the music, most Western music. There are other, other ways of doing music, but 12-tone chromatic scale is what most of the music you've heard. It goes like this. Put up. The simplest thing that it could do, and I screwed it up. All right. All right. So you noticed you, re you recalled that first note that I played, and it didn't sound complete until I played that last note. But they are double, the, the, lower, the upper, higher note is a doubling in frequency of the lower note. This 12-tone chromatic scale is repeated throughout our entire range of hearing. Now, we can make patterns on this chromatic scale. Oh, I'm sorry, I can de define uh, steps. Uh, a half step is the unit of pitch in music. It is defined as the difference in pitch between any two contiguous notes on this scale. There's uh, a half step between four and five. There's a half step between nine and ten. There is a whole step between zero and two and between five and seven. So it's clearly not a metric measurement of any sort. It's really kind of strange, actually. Um, this is not supposed to go to two lines. One moment. That's better. Close enough. <laughs> so we can create different patterns um, think of them as ordered sets of notes. We can make different patterns on the chromatic scale to give different kinds of scales. This particular pattern right here is a very important one in music. It's called the major scale. It goes like this. That particular major scale is called the C major scale because it starts on the note C. The note C is called the key of the scale. The first note, the bass note of the scale, is the key. Now, you notice the black notes here. This, this looks like a piano keyboard. That's because the piano keyboard is based on the C major scale. In fact, our music notation is based on the C major scale, too. And those notes in the back that are black of the chromatic scale are second-class citizens. They don't even get names of their own. They only have names that are relative to the, the white notes they sit next to. So look at that leftmost black note. If you look at it from the perspective of the C, it's a C sharp. Sharp meaning one half step high. Uh, if you look at it from the perspective of the D, it's a D flat. Flat meaning one half step lower. Now, the major scales have a secret key. Do you remember the DCSS, uh, the encryption code for, well, we're lucky nobody's tried to patent this formula right here, because this is the formula for the major scale. If we, in steps, if we follow that and start on any note, absolutely any note in the chromatic scale and follow those steps, we will get another major scale. Like, we'll start on the note D. Go ahead and leave my mic on for this. This is going to be one step up to an E, one step up to an F sharp, half step to a G, one step to A, one step to B, one step to C sharp. And finally, half step back home to D. I can start anywhere. Here's starting on F. G. So the change in frequency that defines a step is not a constant. It changes depending on what instrumentation you have and what tuning method you use. Tuning of a scale is called its temperament. And uh, the modern tuning system that we use is called equal temperament. And it allows me to do this miraculous thing. That was the beginning of Bach's fugue in G minor. But I played it in A minor, and it was perfectly recognizable. Here it is in F minor.
Well, it is just a little bit lower in pitch, still recognizable as the same song. But several hundred years ago, instruments had their own temperaments and different tuning systems. Now, I gotta give you a disclaimer. I am simplifying the concept of tuning here. There are people who write PhD dissertations about tuning and who have complained on Reddit, of course, that I'm being in, simplifying to the point of being inaccurate. But if I followed accurate, this would be a six hour presentation on tuning with a little bit of software engineering. <laughs> so I am going to show you some examples of how tuning works. Through the miracle of modern electronics, I have just changed my instrument into the tuning from the 1300s, medieval tuning. Now that sounded off, it sounded odd. But if you heard the entire piece played that way, by the time you got to the end of the piece, it would start to sound okay. Now, I played that again in A minor. Suddenly, oops, that's, I missed a slide there. Music playable on one instrument was not necessarily playable on another instrument in the same key. So I'm gonna just suddenly switch my instrument to being a key, an instrument that plays in the key of F, not the key of uh, A flat. And I have not changed the tuning of my instrument whatsoever. And I'm gonna play that Bach piece again. But before I do so, um, I made arrangements with the uh, conference organizers. There is an air sickness bag in the seat pocket in front of you. <laughs> I suggest you locate it now. I did not change the tuning. All I did was start on a different note. In that era, instruments could not freely change key like they can in our modern equal temperament. So how does our modern equal, equal temperament actually work? Well, I'm going to show you, or at least I'm going to try to show you. It works mainly by cheating. I have switched my instrument back to modern equal temperament and warning AV people. This is where we may get some horrible feedback. Uh, I am going to give you just a sine wave. Now I'm going to give you a C major chord. Now making my instrument do chords is always a challenge. perfectly in tune. Let's switch back to medieval tuning. The wobble is now very slow. Shows a little bit more on the, on the uh, thing. Can we dim the lights in here a bit or something? Button behind you. Button behind me. There are lots of buttons behind me. <laughs> I'm not going to worry about it. I don't want to... Uh... Let's stop that. <laughs> so, we compromised in tuning uh, to get what we've got today. Everything, all of our songs, every piece of music you've probably ever heard is out of tune. We took, to get equal temperament, we took every one of you that has perfect pitch and threw you under the bus. <laughs> so I'm going to switch back to modern, equal temperament so I can continue with the presentation. We cheated. So we sacrificed the perfect for the good enough because by having everything just a little bit out of tune, we can have music that changes keys with impunity, whereas the old instruments couldn't do that. I need to. And what was the effect of that? If I can get all of my moving parts to move. Wrong place, wrong place. 
The musical effect of that was... That piece by John Williams was meant to give you an emotional reaction, foreboding, mystery, with a little whimsy. He nailed it. When you change keys in a piece of music, you get an emotional response from your audience. And that has allowed music to really become complete and very, very flexible. It's an abstraction. They have abstracted the scales. So reason number one why 400-year-old music still works today, compromising on tuning standards, decouples the scales from the instruments that play them, which in turn enables hardware compatibility. Manufacturers of instruments can tune all of their instruments the same, and people from different parts of the world can get together and play music together, rather than only having small regional tuning systems uh, and Foreign instruments just don't work very well. That's how, at the very beginning of this presentation, I was able to use a Turkish zither and, and, and a, a sitar and play with a bassoon. Those instruments never would have met <laughs> had it not been for equal temper temperament. So it also enabled the Univer Universal Musicians API, the piano keyboard. All right, enough music for the moment. We are going to move on and talk, actually, about software. As soon as I get this set up for my next cue. Adagio con bravura. Adagio means slowly, con bravura meaning with skill. Always keeping in mind, an API should be independent of its implementation. You should be, after my presentation, walking out of here with that as a mantra in your head over and over again. So every lecture that I have given in the last year, eight years, has eventually wandered to crash reporting for the Firefox web browser. <laughs> it's a system called Socorro. I'm the original architect for that software system uh, that has evolved a lot over the years. Um, it looks like this. Um, it is a, a parallel system of many, many machines, all cooperating and saving data in different systems and distributing processing in, among different machines. I'm going to show you exactly how it works and narrate how a crash that happens out in the field anywhere in the world, we get to between five and six million crashes a day out of Firefox, most of them from Flash. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm the, the Firefox logo in the middle left represents Firefox running somewhere on one of your computers somewhere. It crashes, and when it crashes, it sends a packet of information to us about what went wrong. So I'm going to make it crash now. Go. It sends this packet of information to our Apache ModWhiskey-based collectors, which save the crash into a local file system. Then these other uh, processes wake up, move the crash, bifurcate them, and save them into Amazon S3 and into RabbitMQ. It's a queuing system. The processors then wake up, pull jobs out of the queuing system, which tells them what to, what to grab out of Amazon S3, and then they perform a miracle. They take the binary load of data, remarry it with symbol tables from the original build system of your version of Firefox to make a complete picture of what went wrong. We save it back to Amazon S3, we save another copy to Postgres, and we save another copy to Elasticsearch. Now the most important thing in this, this image here is not the processes, it's the arrows because every one of those arrows represents an API call. And the most common API call in this system is called crash storage. It is a classic object-oriented hierarchy that implements a business logic API. Let's look at, look at this. This is uh, an excerpt of the base class. Now, we're not going to go through all of this code. We're just going to look at highlights. It's called crash storage base. And it has two families of methods. It has fetch methods and save methods. Raw crashes are what comes in from the uh, user. Process crashes are what comes, or comes out of our processors that did the miracle. All of these things are hung on a framework 
called fetch, transform, and save. The fetch functions, of course, correspond to the fetch phase. The save functions to the save phase. Almost every one of those uh, programs in that diagram are based on this fetch, transform, save system. In fact, we have implemented this crash storage system for these technologies, and plus a few more. But if you look at that list, these things are not the same. They are not only different technologies, but they, many of these things have different agendas entirely. Some are not even storage. HBase, you know what HBase is. It's a NoSQL system, a massively parallel system for doing MapReduce jobs and also being able to do queries on top of the data. RabbitMQ, it's a queuing system. File system, way of organizing stuff on a hard drive. Elasticsearch, another big parallel system for doing search and analytics. Postgres, a fine, upstanding, transactional, relational database. And Amazon S3, it's cloud storage, the antithesis of structured data that Postgres has. And HTTP is simply a protocol. How can all of these things share the same API? Well, if you think about it, this is Socorro's chromatic scale. The API, the crash storage API, is out of tune. And by allowing it to be out of tune and saying that, all right, programmers using these, these classes, you need to understand which classes you're using and what capabilities they have. But by allowing this dissonance, Socorro is able to treat all of these resources as if they're the exactly the same thing. Even under the covers, we tell HBase, commit and roll back your transaction. HBase doesn't understand that at all. In fact, but HBase doesn't raise an error. We, had, we make HBase just say, shrug and say, oh yeah, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to write your programs with informed consent. So that allows us to do some amazing things. So implementing these crash storage API decouples all these resources from Socorro. It also enables us to write some crash storage classes that are rather meta in their ability. Remember how in that uh, diagram, the crash movers saved to RabbitMQ and Amazon S3, the processors to uh, Amazon S3 and Postgres and uh, um, Elasticsearch, thank you. Uh, it does so by using a meta crash storage class. And I'm only showing one function here, the save process. This is called the multi-crash store. It's just a container of other crash storage. It implements the same API, save process crash, accepts a process crash. But what it does is just iterate over its collection of other crash storage systems. In turn, passing the same process crash to each one of them one at a time. That's exactly what's happened in the processor and the crash mover. So we call the save process, passing in the save, pro uh, save process crash. So great, let's write a program. Let's write this uh, crash mover uh, for us. And it's gonna read from a uh, file system and save to RabbitMQ and Amazon S3. So we dutifully, in fine PEP8 style, uh, we declare, uh, bring these uh, classes into our program space. Now way back at the beginning, I said something about like, every piece of software that I've ever written, I gotta sound like an old man, every piece of software like I've ever written that hard-coded anything is gone and forgotten. So look what I've just done here. I've hard-coded three classes. I don't wanna do that. So how do we decouple the resources from the source code itself? Have you ever heard of the concept of dependency injection? Well, Python can do it very easily. They give us a wonderful tool. It's the import method. It works just like the import function, except you can pass it a string, and it will return back to you the module that you asked it to import. And it will be just a first class module, just as if you had hard coded import this module. So in this particular example here, I'm, I'm getting uh, the, the name of the module to load from the first argument on the command line. So if we wrap that import function into a method called dynamic load, uh, that will allow us to give a dotted path as a string, and it'll find that class in the module import it, instantiate it, and return it to us. Now this is too much code to go through in a presentation. So again, we're just gonna look at highlights. So we pass in a class as a string, we import it, we tear that string apart, chopping all the dots out of it, 
we find its packages one at a time, iterating, it or, iterating over it, find the module, and eventually get the object out, instantiate it, and return it. So now we can write that crash mover independently. So this, we'll use the dynamic load function. Let's just say that the user typed in this on the command line as the first argument. We then grab it off the command line, do our dynamic load, and we have a fetch object for our fetch transform save system. Uh, then let's do the save phase. We get one of these multi-crash stores, instantiate it, and then add to it the second and third items from the command line. RabbitMQ, Amazon S3. Now passing in one final object, which I've, uh, another API, which I'm not going to get into, which is the Crash Mover API, we have an app that we can just run. We can also change exactly where it gets the, the information, where it sends it to. Uh, the processor, the one that performs the miracle, just uses this exact same form, different set of output classes, and using a different uh, algorithm for uh, the transform method. So the Socorro system that started in 2008 looked like this. We got uh, crashes from the, from the world via HTTP, saved to a file system, and then the processors grabbed stuff out of the file system and saved to Postgres. Postgres couldn't handle the volume. We were using cast off old machines from a different project and we just didn't have the, the, the volume. So I changed it to this. So we would start, we would relieve uh, Postgres of some of its duties by saving a percentage. A sampling would only go to Postgres and the rest would be saved away into a file system. In 2010, we decided we were going to use HBase. And so we, we set it up like this so that the crash movers would, or the uh, collectors would save directly to HBase. Have any of you ever used HBase? Mm. Well, let's just say HBase in 2010, <laughs> this failed badly uh, because HBase was at that time not stable enough for the task. And this is where I realized that this crash storage API needed to be invented and invented quickly so that I could go to this form where the collectors went back to saving things to file systems. File systems really do give you five nines of reliability. Uh, but HBase, maybe A9 somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we moved the crash movers. So they would read off the file system, save to HBase and to Postgres. We used Postgres for queuing for the processors instead of RabbitMQ. And then the processors would do their jobs. Uh, then we decided to implement RabbitMQ and get the queuing out of uh, Postgres. Because this crash storage API encapsulates these external resources so perfectly, we were able to write the RabbitMQ mo module in under a week, plug it in, and it just worked. Then that was 2013. <coughs> then later that year, we decided to adopt Elasticsearch to help us do analytics. All I had to do was write an Elasticsearch module add it to the collection of output modules, and it just worked. Then last year, we got the edict from management that we were going to close our own IT department to move everything into the Amazon cloud. So what we did was wrote an Amazon S3 module using the Boto library and plugged it into our system. And here, we're doing it as write-only memory. We're writing the exact same things to HBase and to Amazon S3, but we're never reading out of Amazon S3. We let it go there for a month, so it would just collect data for a month until we were comfortable that it was collecting properly. You know, it did just fine. So later in 2014, now watch the little H-based Lego up in the upper right corner. We re rewrote the configuration for the processors, sent SIGHUP to the processors, they reloaded their configuration, and suddenly H-base was gone, and it was replaced with Amazon S3, and the processors never even slowed down. They didn't, all they did was redirect their input to a different location, not even having to restart. Later that year, uh, the following year, we decided that they worked well enough, we reconfigured again, we took uh, HBase out, sent SIGHUP, they restart, or they reloaded their configuration without HBase. Again, no hiccups, it just went. We were able to move a 70 terabyte database system seamlessly over two months without restarting our system and move it out of our own IT department. Now that was a success story for a uh, abstracted API. 
We're going to go back to music for a moment. We've seen how we can use this API to do the abstraction. Uh, there are other abstractions in music, too, that are useful for us. Movement six on Dante, quickly, because I'm going to run out of time. The music notation. The score of a piece of music graphically reveals its threading model. What is a threading model for a piece of music? Well, what is a score? Score is all of the parts of the piece of music written out in one place so you can see all of the voices at the same time. Its threading model? Well, here is the original sheet music, well, maybe not original, a sheet music for pipe organ for the Bach fugue in G minor. The organist, when they play this piece of music, you can see that it's divided into sets of three lines. The right hand plays the top line, the left hand plays the middle line, and the bottom line is played by pedals on the floor. So let's see, that is one organist, one voice on the right hand, one voice on the left hand, and another on the feet. I count one processor and three threads. <laughs> now, in music, Music can be rearranged. We use a different term. We call it refactoring. So Bach's fugue in G minor can be refactored as a quartet of flutes, four processors running one, one thread each. Flutes are inherently playing one note at a time, so they're one thread. We can refactor again for five trumpets, a quintet, six clarinets, or just go all out, 21 processors, one thread each, and have a full symphony orchestra play it. By the way, when you add more processors to a piece of music, you don't get through it faster. <laughs> so Johann Sebastian Bach was a master at multi-threaded, multi-processing music composition. You know this piece? There's this really great chord that happens next, but I'm only one thread. <laughs> so you don't get to hear that. I could play it, but it's just kind of tough to do. So, but it's not the prelude of the interest, what interests me, it's the fugue. The fugue has this theme in it. At the same time that theme is being played, this theme is being played. If you analyze it, it's actually the same theme, just slowed down, stretched out, and truncated. The organist has to play them both at the same time. No problem. Two hands, two threads, two themes. Sounds great. Except there is a problem. The left hand is already busy playing harmony notes. The pedal notes on the floor are too low in pitch, so the organist has only the right hand to play both themes at the same time. Bach knows this and has made it easier for the organist by taking that uh, slower theme and breaking it up into little pieces. and then takes each one of those little pieces and interleaves them between the notes of the faster theme. They begin on A. This is going to drive audio people nuts. Just leave my mic on. <laughs> then the fast theme goes to G. Slow theme is still on A. Fast theme goes to F. Slow theme is still on A. Fast theme goes to E. Slow theme is still on A. And in fact, the slow theme will stay on A for 22 notes before going on to its second note. Now the musical effect of this is really kind of amazing, bouncing back and forth between these two themes. And in, if you think of the way an organist plays, they can bounce back and forth like a dancer jumping around. For a woodwind musician, though, this is rather a nightmare. <laughs> uh, it is 96 notes in under 19 seconds, and I have to move up to nine fingers at a time between notes. Consequently, this is extraordinarily difficult to play. 
when I first started giving this presentation, I'd screw up badly, frequently. And when I would do so, you would, I would suddenly hear this. The idea was to attract a parade of clowns to come in so that I wouldn't be the only clown standing up here. But I've gotten better at this. So hopefully I won't have to play the uh, March of the Gladiators. So I'm going to play this for you. It's really kind of amazing. Wait. Before I play it, let's do a bit of dependency injection here. You've heard this on the pipe organ before. Have you ever heard it on a celeste? A celeste is the instrument from the Harry Potter theme. Piano. In fact, I think that if they had doorbells in Bach's era, this is what Bach's doorbell would have sounded like. There's someone at the door. <laughs> Thank you. So in terms of software, what did you just hear an example of? That's a prelude in fugue in G minor. No, that was cooperative multitasking done within one thread in a single process. You know, we're doing this in Python more and more now, but I bet you didn't realize this was invented hundreds and hundreds of years ago. We're not doing something new here, we're just doing it in a new way. So reason number two why 400-year-old music still works today. The source code is available and readily refactorable. We've seen we can change the key. We've seen we can change the threading model. We can even change the rhythms of music, and it still seems to work. How many rock groups in the 70s and 80s based their music on uh, classical music? have been standing like this to do that. <laughs> that was Jethro Tull in about 1974. So movement seven, prestissimo, really fast because I'm really going to run out of time. I have no clock in front of me. I have no idea how long we're going. I've got 12 minutes. Um, abstracting threading models. Generally, when we want to change the threading model of a program, we refactor. That's what they do in music. That's what we do. But you know, we don't have to do that. We can do better than that. We can abstract a threading model. So answer these two questions. And these may seem unrelated. In Python, when you write a multi-threaded program, how do you shut down a thread? Anyone? Mm, you join a thread, but you know, let's say we have a thread running, and we want it to stop now. We don't want to wait for it. Join waits. Well, Python doesn't give us a a method to kill a thread. You just have to wait for it. It has to cooperate by checking some authority, some status to tell it to shut down, and it has to agree to do so. Unrelated question, seemingly. When writing in a cooperative multitasking environment, and I'm going to use the example of G-Event because that's the one I'm familiar with, how do you make a greenlit switch contexts to go on to do another task? Anyone? You yield. It cooperates by yielding. If you don't cooperate and you don't yield, other tasks will get starved and won't get to run. Now, you notice the answers to these two questions, even though they were on different topics, both used the same word, cooperates. And in my book, maybe not yours, but in mine, that's good enough for an API. So let's imagine that we had this method for threads. If a thread should quit, we're going to kill that thread by just raising the keyboard interrupt exception. That is going to blow through all the exception handlers and just kill the thread immediately. 
Now we'll write the cooperate function for g event. All you have to do is sleep for zero seconds. That just effectively does a yield for you. Now let's write the crash mover program with this in mind. We're going to start by fetching something from somewhere, and then we'll call a cooperate method. And then we're going to transform that thing by some whatever algorithm was passed in, maybe passing the cooperate method in. We'll get our transformed thing out, and then we'll cooperate. And then we'll save our results, and then we'll cooperate. Wrap them all together in the fetch, transform, save constructor or function or however you implement it, and we end up with something that looks like this. All of a sudden, the fetch, transform, and save become a uh, 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 flock of workers that can be run as multi-threaded, as multi-process, or as cooperative multitasking. And in fact, because these things are done with dependency injection, you can take a multi-threaded program, change its configuration, send it SIGHUB, and it becomes a cooperative multitasking program instead. Now, there's not a lot of call to switch threading models in the middle, but it gives you a wonderful platform to experiment about what is the most efficient way for your system to get you the best throughput. And that's what we do, have done at, at Socorro. So let's engage a little hyperbole here. Decouple all the things. Abstract everything. Because as you know in your heart, there is no problem that cannot be solved by adding another layer of indirection. <laughs> that may well be true, but you will reduce all of your software down to two words, thing dot do. <laughs> and that's not necessarily a good idea. So where do you draw the line on how much abstraction you use and how much you don't? One of the trends that I have seen over the last 40 years of my career is this line gets pushed down lower and lower and lower. We're doing more and more hard coding. We're doing more and more coupling of external resources. It is a product of our programmer's culture and the way businesses hire programmers. How many people in this room have worked for the company longer than two years, longer than five? more than the people when I've given this lecture in Silicon Valley. It's usually no hands come up at five. More than 10? Amazing. That's, that's pretty amazing. There is very little institutional memory in Silicon Valley because the programmers don't stick around. They don't document their code. Nobody understands it. The more abstractions you put in your, your, your code, the more complex it gets. Now, I like to have my layer of abstraction much higher than the norm, but then I'm a heretic, uh, and I want my software to last. So where you decide to put abstraction is up to you and your employer to decide, but I want to encourage you to use more abstraction to make your programs last longer. Movement number eight, Allegro which is fairly fast. The Bach Fugue in G minor. You've heard it, me play this excerpt over and over again. It's time you hear the whole thing properly annotated for programmers. And where did the music go? There we go. We need that maximized to that. This part I have never been able to automate in this presentation. <laughs> I present to you Bach's Fugue in G minor, played, refactored as a quartet, with me playing flute, probably over on that speaker, accompanied by a vibraphone, which is a type of xylophone, a banjo, and a fretless bass.
Thank you. So, reason number three, why 400-year-old music still works today, and something that I have not even touched on yet in this presentation. <laughs> Movement number nine, CODA. Questions, comments, any indignation? <laughs> yes? So the question is uh, how learning materials for how to change the idea of how you write software from older techniques into the newer techniques of abstractions and dependency injections and all and that sort of thing. Well, you can follow the method that I used. Have a 40-year career. <laughs> <laughs> um, I honestly do not have an answer for that because at this point in my career, it seems so fundamental to me, and so I don't know what those resources are. I learned dependency injection in the language Java. <laughs> yes? Patterns. Books on patterns. Yes, that's a very good idea. Any other questions? Yes? Do you think we'll ever have 400-year-old uh, software? Will we ever have 400-year-old software? Yes, I think we will, honestly. Um, if you look at um, kernel code, um, things in the basic and the operating system, I mean, there's some very old stuff in, in Unix that is still in use today that's probably original. Uh, and maybe it will last, I don't know, as virtual machines somewhere in some museum. <laughs> yes? That's, that's quite true. I mean, the, 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 the cards for looms are programs. Yeah. Yes? Big hop, big turn, big kill. If someone blocks in the presentation, those, those words are meaningless to them. Where do they go? Uh, probably a Unix book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Those are signals that given by the operating system. Uh, sig term means shut yourself down in an orderly manner. Uh, uh, sig hop means reload your configuration and restart, and sig kill means die now. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I just add a comment to the tools piece, and because I really am 40 years like you. Mm -hmm. So uh, the suggestion would be whenever you write something, ask yourself what kind of thing is this to explore whether going up one step in the ladder of abstraction is worthy. Mm -hmm. What kind of thing? I'm supposed to be repeating the questions and comments, but I don't think I can repeat all of that. <laughs> uh, anything else? What? Oh, when that book, Gerda Escher Bach, came out, I, I consumed that book. I was 19 years old, and it changed my life. I had um, four epiphanies in programming in my life. One, that book. Two, understanding recursion. Three, um, object-oriented programming, and four, recursive pattern matching in Lisp. Those four events were seminal in my uh, development as a software engineer. Yes. What's the worst piece of software you've ever written? The worst piece of software I've ever written? I don't know. It's gone. I've forgotten it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm sure there are some atrocities out there in my current working code. Um, I'm very much of a, um, an ad hoc programmer. I, I, when I want to design something, I prototype it. And then I prototype it again and run it. I, I'm not a big test-driven design person. I come from an older school. But I understand its, its uh, um, importance, and I just haven't fully embraced it. I write my tests, but often get very frustrated that I spend more time on failing on tests that fail because of flaws in the tests than flaws in my programs. That's a problem in my thinking and my, the way I work, I think. 
Yes? How old was I when I started programming? Um, my first programming experience was when I was 14 in 1974. My high school got a terminal to the local university's computer, uh, and I taught myself the language basic and immediately started writing games. However, um, if you look back, I started programming long before that. Um, back when I was eight years old, uh, I had access to a 1955 United Tropicana pinball machine. And I would have my friends play it, and I would open the back and manipulate it, and eventually started programming with a soldering iron. <laughs> and I taught myself Boolean logic uh, probably about age eight or nine. Radio Shack was wonderful back then. <laughs> Rest in peace. <laughs> All right, thank you very much uh, for having me here. I've really enjoyed this. If you can stay seated for a moment here, there are some general announcements that need to be made.